Let's cross to Canberra now and catch up with the Environment Minister, Susan Lee, who joins me now from Parliament House. Thanks for joining us, uh, Minister. I wanted to sort of pick your brains, first of all, in your role as former Health Minister. Obviously, you've got some, some expertise mm -hmm. and experience from that role. And uh, on the coronavirus and the briefings that you've been given, given everything we know, mm -hmm. would we expect at some stage for all of Australia to be exposed to the virus? Well... It's good to be on your program, Chris, and the answer is we don't know, but what we do have in Australia is an incredibly strong health system. We have a good flow of information between the states, between the Commonwealth. We have almost daily briefings by our Prime Minister and the Chief Medical Officer, Dr Brendan Murphy. So we are in the best possible place to withstand whatever this virus brings and there is no point in being alarmist. Uh, my daughter who lives in Sydney just sent me some photos of empty supermarket shelves, no pasta, no toilet paper and so on and we're seeing this sort of somewhat panicked buying around the country and I understand that but we just need to tune into the messages that we will get and we as the government will explain everything to the best of our knowledge as we know it and we will have your information to you every single day. I would have thought we're normally a pretty uh, stoic uh, people, but it is surprising to see this panic buying. Uh, does it worry you that that might manifest itself in other ways? There doesn't seem to be anything publicly said or done mm. to have triggered this. It always worries me when people believe things that are not true or are not backed by evidence. And obviously where there is an unknown and there is an unknown around this virus, uh, that will happen. So we have to uh, listen to what we do know and take the best possible advice from doctors. And they are leading this response. And I think that's the most important thing for everyone to understand doctors are leading this response, whether it be our chief medical officer or the state health officers, all linked to a plan, if things do get worse, to a hospital system that is prepared to manage whatever comes its way and to, you know, the, the highest possible standards of disease control and epidemiology anywhere in the world. Another great advantage for us is that we're an island nation, of course, and we've now got the travel ban uh, affecting China and Iran with uh, pretty extensive outbreaks in South South Korea and Italy, is it realistic to think we might actually increase travel bans now rather than relax them? I'm not going to add to speculation, Chris, other than to say the best place to look is the travel advice on the DFAT website. It's where we all look, it's where the Chief Medical Officer looks and uh, it's got the latest and the most up-to-date information depending on where you want to go in the world. OK, let's get back to your bailiwick uh, in the environment now. And as Environment Minister, do you believe that Australia should sign up, sign up to net zero emissions by 2050? We shouldn't be signing anything that we don't, that isn't backed by a plan, by actions and by costings. And if you contrast the Labor message with what Angus Taylor is saying, you can see how we have the interests of Australian families at heart as well as the interests of the global climate. We can do those together. We are talking, and Angus was talking just today in the Parliament, in a question time, you know, filled with, as you said, a whole lot of invective and nonsense from the other side. We were dealing with the real issues like coronavirus, like the technology map that Angus will soon release as a draft for consultation. Again, our approach is to be transparent with the Australian people, to talk to them, to consult with them. And we do need to remind those opposite in this parliament that we were elected and we're delivering on what we said we would do, and that includes being careful, being responsible, and in my space, Chris, protecting our environment, because that is a whole world of adaptation and resilience that links with our farmers, that links with our Antarctic science, our investment on the Great Barrier Reef, and so much that is good about Australia when it comes to uh, our beautiful natural world. In your own home state of uh, New South Wales, you've got a coalition government that has committed to the net zero by 2050 uh, target. Mm -hmm. They don't have a plan or costings to get there. Are they being irresponsible? Uh, look, I talked to my counterparts there. I talked to them about recycling and plastics and litter and how we can generate new jobs in this exciting area and ministers of environment sitting around the table have very much con concentrated on waste and recycling. I'll leave their comments about other matters to them. I don't like to invade into state decision-making or state responsibilities. I like to engage them and I like them to help us with the important things that matter to us. But I think everybody would agree with the common sense of 
approach you take on uh, such a target, uh, you shouldn't sign up to a target unless you're prepared to show a plan to get there and have some idea of the costing. So surely uh, you know, the, the Coalition State Government in New South Wales, in South Australia and Tasmania for that mm. matter, are all being irresponsible in signing up to these virtue signalling targets without showing anybody any way of getting there. Mm. Well, Chris, I've been in politics long enough to know that pointing the finger at state colleagues doesn't normally get anywhere. Uh, I like to work constructively with them. We don't always agree. Of course we don't. Uh, you know, they've got uh, their imperatives, their decisions to make, their actions to take. Where they link with our agenda, particularly in the waste and recycling, I have very robust conversations with them. For example, the states collect a lot of waste levies every time they, uh, every time anything goes to their landfill, and I'd like to see some of those waste levies find their way into new infrastructure infrastructure and they are and we are developing that recycling remanufacturing processing infrastructure that will take our you know this exciting area of microeconomic reform to something where we haven't seen before we're talking about new recycling adding 5000 jobs just in the near future to the Australian economy it's exciting yeah, on the recycling, you're talking about having uh, government departments and agencies actually giving preference to recycled products. That's a way of supporting the industry. Isn't that a backdoor way of subsidising recycled products? Well, what the Prime Minister has said is that every procurement from every agency needs to consider the best and maximum use of recyclables. So it's carefully phrased, it will be done in the right way and a balanced way because if you do what uh, our political opponents often, require, often suggest, which is put uh, legislation in place, put levies in place, put mandated targets for recycling, demand for example, that every percentage of every product has to have this much recycled plastic. I mean, all of those, all of those things sound good, but what they do is add costs. What we, we know, we are dealing with public money when it comes to procurement, and we're going to be responsible about that. We know when it comes to the household budget, it, it might be easy to say in Canberra, but there are people for whom the cost of plastic bags in the supermarket uh, adds considerably to their weekly spend, and they need time to adjust, and they need to understand why, as a country, we're moving towards less waste, less landfill, but we're doing it with people, not to people. I've got a half a tonne of landfill in my car now with all the plastic bags mm. that I've had to buy because I keep forgetting <laughs> to take them in. Now, um, just um, getting back to some other issues here, as you mentioned, uh, Parliament uh, today, Labor really heavily focused on sports mm. rorts. Uh, now, when there's a scheme like this, which is uh, distributing grants around the country, I think the public knows there's always going to be politics in, involved. That, that's kind of obvious. But there would be no problem, would there, if the Prime Minister was suggesting to the Sports Minister where priorities might be? Isn't that the way politics and government operates all day and every day? Look, I think the main thing about this program is that the guidelines were followed in every case, that there were no recipients of any grants who were not entitled to them, who did not fit with the guidelines. These are the Commonwealth grant guidelines. They're quite specific. They're quite definite. We all comply with them. And, of course, we would love to see more grants hit more recipients. It's always the case. There's never quite enough. You so know, you don't the, reckon... The, so the Prime Minister... So the, so the my, Prime Minister or his office might have dropped a line to the Minister mm -hmm. suggesting which were some of oh, their look, favourite projects? I, I'm not going to comment on that, Chris, because I only comment on things that I know about. I know the conversations that I have and the uh, emails that I send, but I don't, uh, you know, I don't comment about what I don't know about. Thanks for joining us, Minister. I appreciate it.